This is the sound of turning ideas into software. This is the sound of engineering and passion. Work. Work more. Work harder. Experiment. Build. Break. And build again. Write code. Improve it. Job done. Celebrate. Insurance. Finance. Retail. Defense. Robotics. Energy. Amethyx. Welcome back to another episode of Data Science at Home podcast. I'm Francesco, podcasting from the regular office of my company, Amethyx Technologies, based in Belgium. Today, I want to introduce another important model, and I would say a milestone from uh, from the DeepMind community and from the researchers at DeepMind that have put together uh, another important model that um, is considered uh, one of the first generalist agents uh, in the literature. And uh, why I say this is important is because, well, first of all, there is no production rate result. There's still a lot to work on. But in my opinion, it's a very interesting milestone because it starts, I would say, a new era uh, or it sets the beginning of a new era. Uh, for the development and the design of generalist agents or generalist models. So why uh, the you know generalist model or the term generalist, uh, first of all, doesn't have to be misunderstood with artificial general intelligence. We're very far from there. Uh, probably the models and the mathematics that we are using today, uh, as I already said a number of times on this show, is probably not even ready or not even appropriate for that type of uh, uh, modeling and and for reaching human capabilities in pretty much any task but what a generalist agent does or wants to do is to have the capability of uh, of solving different tasks or multiple tasks at the same time and so you would not have a model that is as it happens today uh, specialized in for example doing uh, object recognition or phase detection or um, street sign uh, recognition and so on and so forth in a very specialized way but we would have a model that in fact an agent that uh, can do many things right and so for example it can recognize uh, images uh, it can recognize objects in an image it can describe a scene it can play a game it can generate text it can chat with humans and so on and so forth so that's the idea of having a generalist model. Uh, now, the, of course, there are many, many challenges, and we'll, we'll see how DeepMind researchers have uh, dealt with that. But there are several benefits of having, of course, a generalist model or generalist agent. For example, you no longer need to handcraft policy models with appropriate inductive bias for each domain, which is usually the case when you have, uh, you know, multiple specialized models that are put together in forming a so-called generalist agent. And it also it increases the amount of and diversity of training data uh, because, of course, data come from different domains. And most of the times, you know, you never have, um, you know, shortage of data. Uh, you already it, it's already quite difficult to have shortage of data for many sectors and many domains out there. But, uh, you know, in case you are dealing with domains that require, for example, knowledge transfer or for which there is not appropriate or not a particularly large amount of data available or data are extremely expensive with respect to other domains, well, a generalist model can also be trained by uh, from other data, data coming from different domains. And so that might help you know, dealing with the uh, scarcity of data whenever that applies. So I want to start by giving some numbers and make sure that everybody is on the same page here, that we are still speaking about uh, a very large model. Uh, it's 1.2 billion parameters. Uh, the model is called GATO, G-A-T-O. And um, it's a generalist agent that, you know, you don't have to consider it as a small model at all. 1.2 billion parameters is a massive model already, not approachable by any off-the-shelf machine that you might be, uh, you know, dealing with at home or, uh, or in your office. So it's something that requires dedicated hardware, dedicated infrastructures for a number of days, uh, of continuous training, and we'll we'll get into these details uh, in a minute. Also, another thing that is important to mention: uh, Gato was trained. Gato, Gato, I don't know, uh, was trained offline in uh, a 
purely supervised manner. And this might be kind of a, uh, let's say, a limitation uh, because there are many tasks, especially when it comes to gaming, for example, for which you would like to have some sort of uh, reinforcement learning injection or a reinforcement learning based approach to training. Um, and so in this case, that didn't happen. And uh, as a matter, you know, to be fair, uh, the authors already understood that type of limitation. And they also, uh, of course, mentioned that in the uh, conclusion and future work that, uh, of course, adding a reinforcement learning approach to the training would definitely help. So what does this model do? Uh, well, uh, first of all, this model ingests a number of um, input uh, inputs that, of course, come from different domains. For example, there is text, there are uh, Atari images and discrete actions when it comes to playing uh, arcade games. Um, there are images uh, that have been annotated, uh, for example, with description or the alt text from, from web pages. Uh, there is uh, text coming from, you know, images and questions. So, for example, there is a, an image and there is a question. Eventually, we, even with an answer um, of, for example, what what is that? What is in that picture? There is a, a, a nice dog. There is a cute cat. You know, and if you provide the uh, input and the output or whatever the the network should be. Um, uh, responding to that particular input, you would have f essentially the, the, the pair, the XY pair that deep learning networks are used to deal with. And finally, there are images uh, and continuous actions. Um, and the, the continuous actions are due to the fact that um, the network has been trained to deal also with a robotic arm. So together with, uh, uh, you know, analyzing text and uh, eventually providing an answer for a particular question um, and also understanding, let's say, I'm quoting understanding uh, images, um, the network, the GATO model, is also uh, capable of uh, maneuvering a, a robotic arm. And so that's why that is also part of the input uh, in the training uh, process. Um, now, the very first thing that uh, developers and engineers and researchers have been doing is, of course, taking care of uh, so-called tokenization. Um, there is, of course, a, uh, an infinite number of ways to transform data into tokens. And so, of course, the tokenization is something that it kind of comes more kind of an art <laughs> or dark art uh, from the researcher. Um, and also, you know, also because tokenization has to be done in a way uh, that is, first of all, uh, computationally efficient, but also has to maintain some sort of semantics uh, in the token. So you don't want to uh, you know, lose information when you tokenize something. And so that's why there are different flavors of tokenization and there are uh, there is an impressive amount of detail in the, um, in the official paper that presents this work uh, that I, of course, will report in the show notes of this episode uh, on the official website, datascienceathome.com. But uh, the tokenization, as uh, as I said, has been applied, you know, different flavor of tokenizations to different, um, to different data types. And so, for example, text is encoded uh, with a sentence piece with uh, uh, something like 32,000 subwords into the integer range from 0 to 32,000. Um, discrete and continuous values are also uh, tokenized uh, with raw major order, uh, both in case they are discrete, both uh, or um, floating point values as well. Uh, images are also transformed into sequences of non-overlapping patches or tiles, 16 by 16 in raster order, um, and then each pixel in the image patches uh, is then normalized between a range negative one and one. Uh, and of course, normalized, which means divided by the square root of the patch size, which is of course four, square root of 16. Now, all these tokens are um, essentially uh, embedded. So after tokenization and sequencing, because you know you have to um, um, create the sequential, you know, put the input in sequential order, in fact, the tokenized version of the input in sequential order in a sequence, um, the researchers apply a parameterized embedding, embedding function um, to each token. And, you know, that's clearly to uh, maintain uh, some sort of control on the dimensionality of the problem. Um, we have seen this happening a number of times already. It's a pretty much standard, standardized technique when it comes to uh, high-dimensional models. 
and finally uh, the tokens that belong to image patches so the the you know the visual ones the the one for for the images are also passed or embedded using a single restnet uh, block uh, in order to obtain a vec one vector per patch and so when it comes to training uh, gathers network architecture as essentially two components that uh, work together. The first is the uh, embedding embedding function that, of course, as I said, transforms these tokens to uh, token embeddings. And then we have the sequence model uh, that simply outputs a distribution over the next discrete token. So essentially, the model becomes a model that uh, predicts the next token, right? Now, for this type of model, you can use a general sequence model uh, that, you know, would work as a predictor of the next token. Uh, and we have seen this many times in many domains, even on this show, uh, we have seen, you know, the sequence models in action to predict the next token when it comes usually for NLP, uh, NLP models. But um, researchers at DeepMind, however, they chose a transformer uh, for scalability reasons. And uh, as I said, 1.2 billion parameter uh, model is not something that you can deal with uh, your regular laptop here. It's something that requires dedicated hardware. And of course, it's something that requires a, a scalable uh, se uh, sequence model as well. Um, let me give you some numbers about the architecture the, of the neural network. Uh, it's uh, a 24 layer uh, with an embedding size of uh, 2048. And uh, there is also a post attention feed forward hidden size of uh, 8,196. And uh, uh, of course, that totals 1.2 billion uh, parameters. The, uh, the training model, uh, the, the training process has been performed on a 16 by 16 TPU, so Tensor Processing Unit V3, um, for uh, 1 million steps uh, with a batch size of 512 samples and uh, uh, for about four days. So when it comes to the data sets that have been used for, um, for training, you know, to train Gato, uh, well, it has been trained on a relative, a very large number of data sets um, comprising natural language, image data sets, of course, um, and uh, Atari games as well. When it comes to the vision language data set, um, they have used a line uh, that consists of 1.8 billion images and uh, the alt text annotation of each image. Uh, LTIP uh, stands for long text and image pairs, uh, which consists of uh, 312 million images with captions. And of course, many others uh, like uh, conceptual captions, Coco captions um, are also captioning datasets with uh, uh, about 3 million and 120,000 uh, image text pairs respectively. So as you can see, only for the vision and language, uh, there is an impressive amount of data uh, at, uh, at their disposal. Uh, I already mentioned the fact that the model can also maneuver a, a robotic arm. And uh, of course, researchers have used um, RGB stacking data it's an environment that um, uh, is made of blocks, RGB blocks, and uh, essentially the task of the robot is to stack these blocks together. And this has happened in real and simulation. So are, are we curious to know how did it perform after training and what are the capabilities of such a generalist agent? Well, um, to start with, you know, before showing the results, of course, we have to uh, explain what does it mean good and bad, right, for such, a, for such an agent. And so, uh, you know, performance are measured as a percentage where 100% uh, corresponds to the, the, the task, you know, that an expert, how an expert would solve that particular task. And of course, 0% corresponds to random policies. So, so essentially, randomly uh, assessing the uh, the solution of that particular task. And uh, depending on which benchmark uh, the researchers have used, they have used many, uh, and of course you will find the details in, uh, in the official paper. Um, I will just mention a few. Um, there is a relatively okay -ish <laughs> result, uh, for example, when it comes to the uh, ALE Atari, uh, Gato achieves the um, uh, average human scores for uh, 23 Atari games, uh, which is pretty good, you know, considering that uh, we haven't trained the model uh, specifically for, you know, playing Atari games. 
um, but just you know just together with many other tasks, uh, it's it's pretty decent, I would say. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, this has been done in completely supervised manner. So the training, usually a training, a, a deep learning, a deep learning network playing games, usually happens, you know, in a under a reinforcement learning context. There is also Baby AI. It's another uh, benchmark um, that is used for assessing the quality of the solution provided by a uh, an artificial intelligence model. Uh, and Gato achieves over eighty percent of expert score for uh, nearly all levels. So that's also pretty good. Um, for the most difficult task that is called boss level, <laughs> for a reason, uh, Gato scores 75%. So also there, considering that, you know, uh, behaving as an expert would be 100%, being at 75% in a uh, first attempt of generalist uh, agent, uh, I would say is not that bad. Finally, on uh, MetaWorld, uh, Gato achieves more than 50% for all uh, 44 out of 45 tasks uh, that researchers have trained and over 80% for 35 tasks and over 90% for just three tasks. So there are three tasks where uh, Gato apparently performs way better than, uh, than the others. So, you know, as a first attempt, all this, uh, all this work is, I would say, uh, absolutely uh, interesting and uh, worth, worth the reading um, because there are several techniques and several details, especially provided in the appendix where, um, you know, if you are a deep learning practitioner, you definitely would like to, to read. Um, of course, in this show, I cannot go to, through all the details of, uh, of this model. That's what academic papers are for. Uh, but what uh, I would like to spend a few words about the impact uh, of such a model, uh, which is, in my opinion, also very important. Um, because, you know, as I said, generalist, generalist agents are, are growing in, in terms of uh, interest from the community, uh, though they're currently uh, not present at all in production environments for a reason, uh, because there are many risks, um, of course, many benefits as well, but uh, definitely many risks, too many risks uh, before deploying a generalist agent in, um, uh, I would say, an uncontrolled environment or an environment in which uh, there are also humans. Uh, one thing I would really be um, you know, cautious is uh, re related to the cross-domain knowledge transfer, uh, which in my opinion is a very powerful concept. You know, the fact that you can train a neural network in a particular domain and then extrapolate or transfer that knowledge and utilize that knowledge in another domain, in another sector, that's, you know, absolutely powerful. Uh, but, um, you know, I would raise an eyebrow uh, if you trained a, let's say, neural network or a massive model playing arcade games, maybe fighting games, and then move that knowledge into the real world on another task that, I don't know, uh, requires, for example, surveillance or requires to interact with humans. You know, you never know how that um, knowledge has been transferred, uh, in fact, from one domain, which is fighting, after all, uh, into another domain. So, also, another thing that we, we don't have to forget is that uh, deep learning models and, you know, statistical models in general, um, in fact, optimization is, is a bad beast sometimes because we are, you know, what we are doing here is minimizing the loss function. And uh, also about that in the paper, there is a, a very interesting section how the, the researchers have designed the uh, uh, function optimization part and, of course, the loss function optimization. But essentially what deep learning does is uh, minimizing a loss function, minimizing a function. So there is nothing that, uh, you know, gives you a quantitative approach to, for example, ethics or to uh, acceptance, how a particular action, how acceptable is a particular action in a particular context, in a particular scenario. So, you know, these are all, uh, you know, things that still need to, to be discussed and to be uh, taught considerably uh, by the community and not just by the researchers or by uh, deep learning practi practitioners or coders who just want to see something, you know, tangible, uh, a model that learns stuff uh, automatically something that of course is very appealing to the mind of a developer 
probably less appealing to the mind of a regulator who has at some point uh, take the decision of uh, uh, dealing with that particular model and eventually leave that model uncontrolled in an environment where there are other humans. That's it for today. Of course, I will take the chance to invite you to the Discord channel, which is our official channel where we speak about all things machine learning and AI. Uh, and of course, uh, you, you are free to propose any, uh, uh, any topic you would like me to speak in the next episode. Last but not least, I recently started again uh, a, a series of hands-on sessions on Twitch. So I also invite you to drop by. There you will find the schedule of my Twitch live coding sessions uh, where uh, you can interact live with me and uh, of course with other followers and viewers and uh, we can just have fun. That's it for today. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Speak to you next time. You've been listening to Data Science at Home Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, or Podbean to get new fresh episodes. For more, please follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook or visit our website at datascienceathome.com.